Hello, everybody. Welcome to AEC Stories, the USS Mount Hood podcast. This is SM3 Len Dempsey, or should I say former SM3. Today, my guest is my former operations officer. This is the first officer and one of the most amazing officers from our ship. One of my favorite guys, John Joyner. Hey, John, how are you doing today? Hello, Len. Uh, Looking forward to sharing some sea stories, brother. That's good. So it's a different course you took getting in the military than I did, for sure. Um, I just uh, remember meeting you one day on the signal bridge. I don't know if we were parked in San Francisco. Where, Where did you get on the ship? Uh, gosh, you know, I was, <laughs> I was trying to think of that because all my other ships, I remember the first time I saw them, you know, I'm pretty sure it was Concord. I'm pretty was- sure we were at Concord when I came to meet the ship. Yeah. Okay. But I met you and I, I, and we might've been in Oakland Naval Supply Center or somewhere because I remember the mm-hmm. city being in the background Okay, and, uh, you and I started talking, we're having a cigarette because that's what we did back then. And sure did. we were, we were talking about something. And all of a sudden we started speaking Italian to each other. And I'm like, (laughs) and I I think we, but we both were going, how does this guy know Italian? Yeah. How does this guy know? (laughs) (laughs) You're like, they send the signalman E3s to Italian school too. I'm an officer. How did he get the language school? (laughs) Oh my gosh. How, why did they send you to that school? Cause you were getting stationed there. You mean uh, Italian? Yeah. The language school. Yeah. Uh, the uh, after my division officer tour and before my department head tour. So basically in between my first and second sea tour, my shore tour was in Italy and it was an exchange tour with the Italian Navy. And so um, I went to six month uh, total immersion uh, language school at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey mm. and then lived in Italy for three and a half years speaking only Italian. Wow. So like when you met me on the Mount Hood, I had just recently finished living in Italy. You were learning to speak, you know? you were learning to speak English again. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty, I was still dreaming in Italian probably at the time that you met me. So where were you stationed in Italy? Uh, the, well, the, before the Mount Hood, uh, I was, uh, stationed in Livorno, uh, which is up by Pisa in, in near Florence. Okay. You're not going to believe this. That was my hangout, Tirrenia. America. Yeah, Terrania. Oh my gosh, the beach at Terrania. American, American beach. That was my hangout. I was like, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't even know we had that much, even more in common. So, well, pretty yeah. cool. This is a discovery process. I don't come here preloaded. Yeah, we're going to get back on that. We'll probably be talking about that one even later. But uh, Livorno, I used to camp on that base in high school because they had the campground on the base, if you recall. You know, on the on the army base there. Yeah, the the uh, Camp Darby was the closest U.S. Inst- uh, installation to where I was posted, and so once a week I would drive an hour up to up, or not, but maybe it was forty five minutes up to Camp Darby to like get my mail and and shop at the exchange and things like that. It was quite the life. Yeah, that was that's a very cool life, and that you're probably one of the only people I have that in common with from the Mount Hood, but. I grew up there as a military brat. And my father taught in Vicenza. Did you ever make it up there, up in northern Italy? Yes, I did. I had uh, army buddies that I met at language school that ended up getting stationed up there in northern Italy by Vicenza, and I went to visit them. Uh, they had a fantastic exchange up there. You know, Caserma, uh, Italy. Yes, I bought the most killer stereo system like the tower stereo system there that I treasured for years and years. That's funny. I was such an audiophile <laughs> myself. I was like, I, they would always have, and I, and I know we're going to get back to sea stories, but this is part of it. It's like as a kid growing up there on a military base, I see all these army ranger and airborne guys running by me. I'd go to the exchange and my friend's mom did demonstrations for Bose, you know, reflecting speakers, music. And it was like, three thousand dollar system and i'm like one of these days and and now that i could buy one i don't want it but (laughs) (laughs) we had the newest the newest latest and greatest in stereo equipment at that exchange Uh, better than places i saw when i came back to the states for some reason i think uh maybe because it was popular what was happening in japan or something i I don't know but um what, what are your some of your favorite memories of italy oh there's so so many lynn uh it's hard to not live in Italy and speak Italian and not like really consider 
you know, that a part of your, of your heart. Uh, and, and I, I, I'm getting emotional right now just as thinking, what are my memories of Italy and springing back all the, the fun, the, the, the family, the excitement, the thrills, the history, the wine, the coffee, the culture, the culture. <laughs> it's <laughs> just one a big immersive experience. I mean, there's, it's 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 truly living. Uh, you know, I've I have been all over the world and been all kinds of cultures, and I I think that the the Italians, uh, Central Italy, uh, from from Rome to Florence, you know, that portion of Italy, those people have got it down how to live. <laughs> they really seem to be the most with it, comfortable people. Uh, I've ever met anywhere in the world in all my life. The, so, you know, they they have a, they've had a head start on us, a couple thousand year head start, wow. and it shows. It's it's <laughs> it's it's crazy because here you were being an officer, then you come to the ship. I had already been to probably all the same nightclubs and discos and bars and beaches as you had, and um, we didn't know this. You're my boss. I'm like, well, that's my boss. I don't talk to him like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like that's my boss. I'm not going to share that we actually have so much in common, you know. But yeah, it's actually weird. But I mean, I I remember when I first met you, and I thought, wow, this is a squared away guy, you uh, know. Thanks. And uh, I'm I'm not even sure when I met you that I was like aware that you were like in my department, even you mm -hmm. know uh, that you were just maybe a shipmate. And I thought, wow, this is a cool guy. So we have had quite a history, Lynn. We have. It, it's funny how we're intuitive, and we're like we realize there's something that you have something in common, even though you could be an officer or enlisted or a chief or warrant officer. Some people you just like, there's some, we have something in common, me and this guy right now we're wearing the uniform. If we weren't wearing uniform, we'd probably be fast friends and going out and seeing the world or something. Well, we're still friends and look at this 25 years later, we're still talking and, and, uh, yeah. you know, so it's, it's a, been a wonderful thing. The, the Mount Hood, uh, you know, in preparation for this podcast and, and, you know, you've been, you know, since you started this, you know, we had the Mount Hood reunion not long ago, which unfortunately I couldn't attend, but I hope to attend the next oh, one. We'll have one. So it's, it's really brought me a lot back to that time and made me reflect on what a fantastic tour that was. And, uh, if I, I, you know, it, it was it the highlight of my life kind of pretty close uh, because we did a lot on the Mount Hood, you know, we fought a war yeah. and, uh, a lot of great, a lot of great things happened on that ship. It's interesting. It was one of the more amazing duty stations. You get San Francisco of places in California. I like LA mm -hmm. and I like San Diego, but there's something special about the Bay area. That's just unique. Yeah. And it's funny. It made me think about this. I was sitting with a buddy of mine years ago and he hadn't traveled very much. And, um, I go, you need to travel more. He goes, I don't need to go anywhere. I live in the most beautiful city in the world. And I go, yeah, right. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of up there. But like you said, you know, Italy has that culture, though. And that's a whole different thing. I miss that, too. And I, I started this because I wanted to jog my memory because sometimes I feel it's fading. And, you know, I think we all get sometimes go, yo, I'm going to write my memoirs or my biography I go, you know, I'd probably get bored the first page into it. What really defines a, a more significant part of my life? And that's how I came to the podcast. And the people in it are really what defines it, you know? So that's why I'm making it about you guys. Um, where, wh how did you end up joining the Navy? Well, gosh, Lynn, I kind of, as a young, you know, as a, as a teenager, and you're thinking what to do with your life. I didn't really, I didn't feel called to have like a normal life, you know, <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't really feel that what everybody else was doing was what was, what was right for me. You, you weren't drawn to be uh, a vacuum cleaner salesman or nothing. <laughs> well, I don't, the whole, like, I want to settle down, have a family, have a house, like be settled. That just never appealed to me. Uh, uh, also it, it seemed, I, 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 I I don't want to say that I wasn't that I've not that I'm not a selfish person or whatever, you know, because we're all human. Yeah. But I felt I could do more. You know, I could do more than just take care of me and some, any family that I might have, and that I could help a lot of people. And the military was uh, a place to do that. And at the time, uh, we had a job. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, an enemy, frankly, mm -hmm. 
and uh, uh, I wanted to help, you know, and I, and I wanted to have an have adventure. I wanted to travel. I wanted all the things that the Navy offers. And for me personally, there was that chance to to serve, you know, to give and that was very strong. And uh, I've never, ever regretted uh, giving those years to the Navy. I was thinking about it before we get on the podcast. I was like, you know, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to backtrack even a little bit more like where you grew up and, you know, what you were seeing. I mean, that kind of makes your conclusion. But I was thinking there's no other business, whether you're the big Apple or Google that says, okay, we train our managers to be this way. And then they come work with these people that way. You come right out of school. You are a trained manager. You are very trained. You can't just come out of college and jump into, you know, head director of Google. You can't. You know, but but in the Navy, you can come in as an officer, you can do well, you can prove yourself there, and you will come in at the standard that's necessary. Of course, there's a learning curve, but you guys are taught extensively. There's a lot of training that goes involved in that. So that's what yeah, I was the, thinking now, about. It, it, there's the, the naval officers, you, you know that naval officers the most respected uh, occupation in the world? You know, like Navy officer among, you know, when, priest, policeman, you know, doc, medical doctor, the, you know, the list of respected occupations and naval officers the most trusted and respected occupation That's uh, and I, 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 I did, i've learned that recently from you know that but uh it's something since this is a podcast right, that's uh, cool. i thought uh, let me add uh, something about the navy is that I, I knew i wanted to do federal service but i didn't uh and i knew the navy had the best uniforms right <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but i wasn't i wasn't for sure sold on the navy and i actually got scholarships Form from the the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy. So I had full ROTC scholarships uh, awarded from all three services, and I I uh, I knew I wanted to go to the University of Colorado because I uh, was in Colorado and it just seemed the right thing to do. And so I went up to the University of Colorado on a weekend, and I and I talked to the Army ROTC people and the Navy ROTC people and the Air Force ROTC people, and. Uh, the army people, they, they were weird because they, they just, they were mainly, it's like a, it was like, they were more interested in my personality. Yeah. Like they kept asking me questions like, I don't, it just didn't fit. It, it, it didn't match what, anything. Uh, You're being, you felt like this is it, awkward. This isn't me, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm coming to you guys. It's, you, and you guys are grilling me on if I'm the right personality type. So just, there was just no connection with the army guys, mm -hmm. the air force guys, they were like, Man, you can write your ticket. You can have whatever you want. You can go wherever you want. You can be whatever you want. You know, sky's the limit, infinite future. You know, go, go, go. And it was almost like too good to be true. Right. Then I go to the to the Navy and he goes, Man, you come in the Navy, you're gonna work your ass off. You're gonna you're gonna have failure, you're gonna have suffering, you're gonna have disappointment, challenges. You know, you're gonna have to work for everything you get. Wow. And I loved it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as I've gotten older, I realize I have a bit of a like a Spartan personality. I like that mm -hmm. more primitive stuff. Uh, but at the time, I was surprised that the, the, the that the branch of the military that was the most gruff and the most rough was the one that appealed to me the most. But it was really a no brainer after I after I spent time with the three services there that to go with the Navy. So it's it, it, it is interesting. That. So what what year did you get in? Uh, this would have the, these interviews would have, would have been in 1978, 1978, the spring of 78 is when I made the decision. Oh, wow. So you, and then I was in the university from 78 to 82 and uh, commissioned in May of 82. So you were from Colorado originally, right? Um, kind of. I'm, I'm born in born in Dallas. OK. Uh, and uh, of Arkansas and Oklahoma parents. Uh, my father was uh, uh, a engineer for uh, basically. How sh Here, this is a weird thing, Lynn. My dad, but I can. Say, my dad was a uh, secret CIA engineer. Oh, interesting. Uh, for my childhood, so when I was living in Dallas, he had like a cover story that wasn't revealed to me until you know, 20 years later, 30 years later. He's like, I'm, uh, a, high, I'm, a, I'm a highly paid pizza delivery man. <laughs> so, well, he, he was supposedly working on the space program, but he was actually working on a spy plane. Okay. And, 
then after he after he was done with the spy plane work, the government gave him a real job with with NASA. And so he he from from my point of view, he was like a career rocket scientist, mm -hmm. but he was actually a spy and then a rocket scientist. Wow. <laughs> so the reason that we, that I we ended up in Colorado is because uh, in Littleton, Colorado is where the Martin Marietta plant is. And anyone who's seen the movie Bowling for Columbine, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of the background. That's almost autobiographical for me, that movie. Wow. Uh, and uh, my father worked at the uh, plant that's featured in the movie uh, that made the Viking Mars lander. So my father was an engineer on the Viking Mars lander project. That's why we were in Colorado. And uh, uh, wow. that's, that's how I ended up there. This is a good podcast. I'm learning some cool stuff. Is it? <laughs> that that's interesting it's like your father your father you traveled you get some culture you get some like uh mysteriousness and all of a sudden even without knowing the story you picked a life in operations and, and the military and international intrigue it's that's uh interesting huh yeah i followed more in my father's footsteps than i that i imagined or would have hoped for and so i mean every kid you know when they want they want to make their dad proud right they want to follow in their dad's footsteps and i, I feel that i did and uh, it's a great, it's a really satisfying feeling. It's funny because my father was an officer in the Marines and um, then he got out and became a, a teacher with GS, a GS worker, government service. And um, my mother was from Europe. He met her in Cape Cod and he's like, Hey, what do you want? And she's like, I want to go back to Europe. So he gets a job over there. He was like the director of, of athletics for all these schools in new England, which was a very high level executive kind of job in the school system but he's like i want to coach i want to play ball i'm a ball player i don't want to be i want to be over there with the, with the players so he kind of demoted himself in a sense and you know it was a respectable decent paying job and you know we could go to the officers club on the base and all that stuff it was like an officer's kind of gig but um yeah i grew up around that culture and i'm like i'm never going to deal with sports and all of a sudden i end up filming sports i end up owning a gym i end up you know, uh, working in the nice. health club business. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you can't escape it. Can you, John? <laughs> You're like, I don't even want to watch the sports, but I keep ending up there. You know, it, it's, it's funny. Um, so when you went through college, you were just laser focused on, on the military. Huh? Well, if you, the Navy ROTC, uh, works that, you know, you're, you're a civilian and you go to a civilian college, but one day a week is, uh, you wear your uniform okay. and uh, we wore the same uniform as midshipmen at the Naval Academy. And you go to your classes in uniform. And then on that afternoon, there's formation and drill. And uh, so it's like one day a week, you're military. And then you spend a month each summer uh, on a, basically on a cruise, okay. you know? So, so you've got one day a week all year and then a month, each summer and that's that's how you're different from the other guy guys and gals at college and uh then, then you get commissioned and then suddenly you're like equal to the guys that went to the naval academy you know uh i i, I would say an opportunity you know the, the naval academy guys start out with a head start mm -hmm. in uh, but very quickly uh you know you you are you're you're able to function at the, to the level of your merit you know uh I, I never noticed uh, a, a discrimination against me because I wasn't Naval Academy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that I did that. I attended. I'm glad I took the path I did. That's uh, pretty cool. So where was your first commission? Where were you first? Where did you start off? That's a good question. Uh, well, it's something that you have to decide when you're a Naval officer is what part of the Navy you want to go in. So it, and the choices are uh, aviation submarines, surface ships, SEALs, and Marine Corps. So those are like five choices. And uh, during these months in the summer that I talked about, the Navy did, did, I think, a good job of showing me what was available. So like I spent a week under the sea on a submarine. I spent a week uh, on a missile launching destroyer. I spent a week at a Marine base doing marine things with rifles and uh you know so I, I got a taste of the different uh communities well, you get to shop you were lucky I... <laughs> yeah the, the, uh, uh, zeros we have sometimes sometimes we have sometimes we have some benefits and one is at least at the beginning you get to choose kind of what 
theater mm-hmm. of the of of the naval forces that you want to work in. And uh, long story short, I picked the surface, mm-hmm. right? And so when you're a surface officer, you go to surface warfare officer school. They have one in in Newport, Rhode Island. They have one in Coronado. So my very first thing after getting commissioned in 1982 <clears throat> was uh, to go spend six months at the surface warfare officer school in Coronado, California, in San Diego. And uh, while you're there, you are assigned your first ships uh, about, ha- about a third of the way or halfway through that six months big drum roll you know you find out your first assignment and my first assignment was a frigate Mm -hmm. the uss stein a knox class frigate and uh uh, it was a great ship i became a man on that ship you know uh, that was my first life experience outside of home and college and uh, it was a great ship with great experiences uh but something that i really wasn't kind of aware of at the time is that i was setting myself up for the rest of my career by being on that ship in that it was not an NTDS ship. Uh, do you know what NTDS? Does that ring a bell, Lynn? Not to me right now, because my memory is okay, Navy, <laughs> Navy Tactical Data System, NTDS. Okay. And it was kind of the old school computerized weapon system. Uh, basically, your Spruance class destroyers okay. were the first ships to have NTDS. Uh, or, no, no, they weren't. They weren't. I take it back. There were some cruisers some cruiser classes that had NTS before that. But at the time I came to the Navy, there was basically the, the newer half of the Navy had NTDS. The older half of the Navy did not. And the frigate that I was assigned to was the older type that did not have the advanced system. And basically that, well, that was career limiting. I didn't know it at the time because uh, basically the reason I'm on the, was on the Mount hood and the reason you know me yeah. then is because my first tour was on a non NTS ship. So you get you, that's uh, the kind of ship you get primed to stay on the rest of the time, I guess. Well, if I had had an NTDS ship first tour, then my second tour, my department head tour, would have probably been on a on a on a combatant. You know, it would have been on a destroyer or a cruiser, or even a battleship or, at this point, right? <laughs> now, I don't know if the battleships had NTS, but it was a really big deal in the day. Uh, whether you whether you knew how to use the, the the computer system or whether you fought the war with uh, the old old fashioned way with like binoculars <laughs> and compasses and charts and uh, you know uh, so the have having that first tour on on the on the Knox class frigate uh, then you know six or seven years later after my Italy tour and I'm in department head school and very similar to the division officer school in California where they have the big drum roll. Here's your ship. We had a similar experience at the department head Mm -hmm. school, which was in uh, Newport or Rhode Island. The tour I had immediately immediately before Mount hood was six months of preparing for that at department head school. And uh, I didn't know at, I didn't know that there was this pathway of non NTDS to non, you know, to to non combatant. Mm -hmm. And so I received assignment to the Mount hood, an ammunition ship. And, this may sound weird because you know how much I enjoyed my tour and what a great tour it was. But on that day that I got that assignment to the Mount Hood, I, I thought it was one of the saddest days of my life. Yeah. Uh, because I thought an auxiliary. What? <laughs> Did I screw up? Yeah, tow truck driver? You know? <laughs> and, uh, it, it, you know, it. once I got to the ship and I started doing the job, it, I quickly got over that. And now I couldn't be more thankful that I had that tour on the hood. You know, I honestly was the, one of the best things that ever happened to me. Uh, but it, but when I first got the assignment to the Mount Hood, it was a bit of a shock. Um, you know, a, a, auxiliary ships are supposedly at the bottom of the totem pole, maybe, you mm-hmm. know, uh, with your your missile shooters at the top. Uh, but something I learned on the Mount Hood is the concept of the supported force yeah. and the supporting force. D- does that Ring a bell, it, it does. It does. You know, I, I was doing some research. I posted some videos the other day, and that base had like 350 Marines there. It was serious business. We had a, you know, we weren't allowed to wander. Um, everything mm-hmm. that was there, I mean, I'm glad it never came up in the news stories. It was some serious stuff. And what we had on our boat was even more serious. Well, you know? You know, the carrier could not do its job without nope. us. We were the most important important ship in the battle group yeah. because we had the bombs and the aircraft carrier couldn't 
as you know, they, they'd only had enough bombs for one eight hour sortie and they were done. Yeah. They needed us every day to refill them with bombs. And, uh, the, uh, the mutual respect that I saw evidenced between us and the combatants, like we can't do our job without them. They can't do their job without us. And that has stuck with me the rest of my life, you know? And so no job has since then has ever been like a second class job, right. you know? Every job is a chance to be on a team and to, to respect and enjoy the, the contributions of everybody else. So that's a life lesson you get from being posted on an AE. Yeah, it was very interesting. It's like, you know, some people had, a you know, it's cool if you were on a big battleship. It's like the one of the ones that makes it in the movies. There's not a lot of movies about the AEs because, you know, to explain it. And that's why I'm using a podcast. To explain it, you have to verbalize it. You have to describe mm -hmm. it. You have to get in the detail. And you're not going to be able to wrap that in a 60-minute documentary because there's so many subtleties that define what that is. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of things I look back at. You listen to my podcast with uh, Griffith. And um, I sure you did. Know, you saw how we saw it from our eyes. And then to hear what Desert Storm looked like from your eyes, like you, you heard, like, I'm the signalman. I saw mine. I saw... Uh, a pirates yeah. you're like mm, that wasn't in our report what the hell are you talking about dempsey <laughs> you're like oh we, we just no but i it. felt i felt what you felt brother i didn't see the mine with my eyes like you right. did but i remember going up to combat at like 5 30 or 6 in the morning the night after we had that near miss and plotting the positions of the floating mines and seeing that we had gone directly over the path of that mine in our track right you know, and I felt in that moment fear, right? I, I felt, wow. Right. I didn't know we were this close to danger. And, uh, I'll never forget that moment. I'm, I'm glad it wasn't repeated often. No, no, that, uh, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> there, there was some stuff that went down. I mean, I know that, you know, well, you were on this. It's like, okay, you know, people have gotten out of our ship. I've helped some veterans file for their claims and things with the VA. And, um, you know, as an enlisted guy, we weren't really explained. I don't know if it was different for you as an officer. We weren't explained that we were entitled to medical care. We could have, you know, there was more benefits to get hired in jobs. That was all there, but there was no internet back then. And there was nobody grabbing us by the hand. So we were getting out of the Navy, like, have a nice day. And you're in the civilian world and you're just swimming in, in hell because, you know, you don't know what to do. I, I, I had SM2 Dalton on the other day and he was like, yeah, it was like, you know, one day you're, you're, you're steering, a um, an aircraft carrier through the Indian ocean. And the next day you're taking out garbage for five bucks an hour. Well, you know, you know if I, if, if I could reach out to like, you know, uh, people getting out of the service now or in the near future, mm -hmm. it's like, you got, you're, you are, uh, a champion, you know, like I wish I had known how. I don't know how valuable or useful I was when I got out of the Navy. Right. I may, you know, I, I'm not one to, again, not, it's an ego thing. Like you don't, you want to be modest. You want to cultivate personal modesty and not have too big of an ego. But I realize now I way undershot. I could have gone to work directly for basically any outfit in the world. You know, I, I could agree. have, I could have, I could have stepped into any company and they would have been falling all over themselves to hire me. And, uh, again, I'm not regretting the path I took. I ended up starting at a, at a, at a, a, a modest IT company in Arkansas, mm -hmm. um, when I could have been hired by like Microsoft or Apple, you know, or IBM. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I didn't yeah. think that I was that, I didn't think I was worthy or whatever, and, and, but Naval Navy people are, you know, we are, yes. we have an experience that nobody else can touch. And the, Business savvy employers know that. Right. And so I would say, you know, that a military career uh, is is a launching pad of infinite possibilities. Uh, There's a lot of knowledge where people don't get it. Like if you want to go to law enforcement, let's say you wanted to go, you know, get out of the military, your station here in California and you want to go in law enforcement, be a, a police officer in San Francisco. That's a high paying job pays like a pay six figures. And you know, sometimes 200,000 if you're doing enough OT, but you have a 10 point preference thing and people don't know that. And you as an officer, you have all kinds of like managerial skills that if, if the resume is written correctly, you'll, you're going to have recruiters calling you all day long. 
And, but, but you probably thought, like you said, the AE where you undershoot yourself, you're like, well, I was an AE. They're probably looking for guys that are on uh a nuclear cruisers or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought, you know, I thought, well, since I don't, for example, like you just said it, like I'm not a nuke, right? Right. I can't, I can't go straight. If I was a nuke, I probably would have sought employment immediately with like General Electric Bechtel. or, or a, a, another major nuclear plant producer. But I didn't consider that I had a background like that, you know? Uh, yeah, you could have been the manager. They might have been the engineer. <laughs> You're like, hey, I'm the manager. That's cool. You went to that hard school. I was at the beach in Italy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, the Mount Hood, I mean, from there, did you go to another command? Let's see. Uh, well, after Mount Hood, uh, I had a, a, another moment of, of, of opportunity and change that, like, I, I, I realized after my department head tour that I was on this track this non NTDS to auxiliary to it, it was not a track towards command at sea of a combatant. Okay. And that's what naval that's what naval surface warfare officers are are trained to aspire to is to be captain of a combatant, captain of a cruiser or a frigate or a destroyer engaging the enemy with your ship's weapons. Right. That is what we're raised for. And I realized it, I realized that I was not on the same track as the guys that were tracking towards that. And I had, I had a couple of long talks with my recruiter or recruiters. And, uh, they said, yeah, you're behind the power curve. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to aspire to that, you know, you are behind the guys that were in TDS. So I said, well, what can we, what can I do? And they said, well, you can give up, you know, we can send you to pasture, uh, <laughs> you know, or we can give you a challenging tour, uh, where you can prove, get another chance to prove yourself. Yeah. And, uh, they gave me, uh, a couple of choices. Uh, one of them was, uh, turret officer on a bat turret captain on a battleship. Wow. And if you recall, we had a catastrophe aboard one of our battleships with a huge loss of life involving one of the turrets. Mm-hmm. Short. And that, frankly, that could have been me. Mm-hmm. I didn't pick that. I picked the other option, which was a uh, maintenance officer on a carrier. Mm-hmm. And uh, I chose that, and I did a tour of duty on the Carl Vinson, oh, wow. uh, which started me on my computing background because... Uh, Here's another thing. You remember Snap? Snap 2? That was like the database. Was that the database on board the ship? Yeah. That was the computer. That was our old, oldest shipboard computing system. And on the aircraft carrier, the maintenance officer was responsible for the Snap system. And so that gave me my hands-on real-world experience with a a high-value computing system. Mm -hmm. And that started me on this basically gave me a a civilian career that I'm in still in today. And that was on the aircraft carrier. Um, and boy, the aircraft carrier is an amazing duty land. You know, you know, I, I I was only on the carrier for about 18 months compared to about three years on the hood. But when I got out of the Navy, you know, the, the, the the dreams, I had persistent dreams of being on the carrier. Mm -hmm. Like, like of all my Navy experience, that was the most incredible experiences and sights. I can imagine. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like the Death Star, only a little smaller, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's really nothing more colossal on our planet. No, our, no civilization has ever made something as complex and big. And as fast. As an aircraft, as a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. And so being the, being the, uh, the maintenance officer on there, you know, one of my jobs was to spot check that maintenance and maintenance had been done properly mm-hmm. in all areas of the ship. So I got to see every single part of that carrier man from the nuclear reactors to the bomb bays, to the jet testing rooms, to the, you know, the parachute packing rooms. Wow. I, I learned that carrier inside and out, every little part of it. And now, gosh, you know, the whole Navy, how can the whole I? Navy in one, one place, <laughs> the whole Navy, the whole, like the whole package. Right. So that was great. Um, 
And uh, did it work out? Did I prove myself? I kind of maybe I was selected for XO and I went to XO school and I had a, a ch- my XO tour was chief staff officer of a squadron of ships in the Mediterranean. And, you know, I don't regret one bit of it. I couldn't be happier and more pleased with with, with the track I took. And, uh, you know, the my career was basically the Navy ROTC, then this frigate. Mm-hmm. And the Mount Hood, I'm sorry, the frigate, then Italy, the exchange tour with Italy, then the Mount Hood, then the carrier, and then my final tour was a chief staff officer of the squadron of, of Marine Corps positioning ships in the Med. So I had about six six major commands in a in a career. And wow. So how many years did you do total? Wow. I actually only did 17. Okay. I got full, I got retirement though, because, uh, here's another like, you know, charmed life thing, uh, in, uh, I guess it was 1997 or 1998, they had a drawdown mm-hmm. and, a uh, out kind of program offer. Yeah. They had a, like an opportunity. If you were in the certain year group and career classification, you could ask for early retirement. Wow. And I did, um, I knew I was not going to be captain of a combatant. In fact, at, by then I didn't want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you fall, fall, and you fallen I've, in love with computers by then, or what? Well, I, I had. I, I've always been. Gosh, I've been in love with computers since I saw Star Trek as a little boy, right? <laughs> and the captain walks into his stateroom and says, "Computer," and he asks a question, <laughs> any question imaginable, and the computer's going to know the answer. We have that today, right? It's called Google, yeah, Google, Siri, whatever, <laughs> Alexa, Alexa. You know, and so, yeah, I've, I've been about this stuff all along. So thank goodness, you know, that the, my, my tours had given me, uh, a, a usable civilian skill that I enjoyed very much. And, uh, I was not on track to be the combatant commander. And so I took the early retirement. And so I've been drawing a little pension all these years. Nice. And, uh, very, very happy. So you can still go to the bases and stuff too. You, did you get your ID card? Yeah, I have. I still have a, you know, officers get an, a, a military ID. You know, a retired officer gets, you, you keep your indefinite, never expires military ID, mm-hmm. you know, just like you were active duty. Uh, but, but the thing is, I, I kind of rejected my status as a veteran and didn't even, didn't even go to the, any of the bases or any of the VA stuff or anything for a long time. It's only just like the last couple years. I understand that I've admitted I did that too. That I admitted. Okay, <laughs> you understand. You understand. I really do. That's part of the podcast because I was just at with. I said this in the last podcast. I didn't really go deep, but I was just at where you went to where you were at in Monterey for Language Institute. I was at that yeah. uh, Hotel Del Monte. You know that big hotel that they converted into a Navy Lodge, where they have the uh, Naval Postgraduate School. NGIS? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it was there. It's beautiful. And it was empty because mm-hmm. I went there during 4th of July, so it wasn't hustling, bustling with, you know, officers learning their computer stuff and warfare school and all that. But <clears throat> I'm like, cool, I'm on a base. I'm like, I'm on a base. I go to the exchange. I bought a computer that I'm doing this podcast on. It was 600 bucks. I got it for open open box for 175 I'm like, deal. I love the military. You know what I mean? <laughs> So that was cool, but I, I go in and out of it. I, I did push the Navy away because I had a lot of great experiences, but I felt like, well, thanks for nothing when I get out because, you know, I undershot and I didn't go for what I could have been. I, I did actually get successful later on. I did go into sales and I probably surpassed anybody that went to any fancy school in my school and then I lost it all, you know, and that was just because I had something to prove to myself. There was just on pure grind. I mean, in sales, you can mm-hmm. achieve anything. There's really, you want a promotion? Go out there and sell. You know what I mean? You go out there and sell. So are you, are you a good salesman? Yeah, I think so. I'm not, I'm not going to be shy about that. Yeah. <laughs> Look at my. I think you are. I think you are. You sold me on podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you're selling a whole community of veterans on, on what you're doing. So keep it up. Well, I want to, I just want to give back because I'm like, At the point where I'm not chasing the money anymore, I experienced money and I realized that I am that veteran. I am that sailor. I am that guy. And those are my people. And I'm not the guy that I thought I wanted to be. You know, when you grew up and uh, they had those posters of the Lamborghini, the Ferrari and everything in that five car garage, that poster that was big in the 80s or 90s. You know what I'm talking about? 
It shows that mansion with the five like Porsche Turbo, Lamborghini, Countach. Okay, Wait, is is, the, is that as like a goals kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, well, the world became all about mm-hmm. money and Wall Street and hustle in the eighties. You know, it became very preppy and upwardly mobile, and you can do anything. And Tony Robbins and all this world popped out of there. And you know, I'm like, I need to be rich. That's me. And, you know. <laughs> And I finally made a lot of money. I'm like, well, I'm not any happier. I'm actually more stressed out. And all these expensive things own me. I don't own them. And hey, I'll take you back to a simple memory. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a TV commercial uh, for Navy recruiting back when we were kids. It was about, you know, join the Navy and see the world. Right. The Navy, it's not just a job. It's an adventure. And the, you know, that theme uh, and they would. And I remember the commercial had sailors. uh riding horses like in puerto rico or something (laughs) you know it was just a crazy fun thing yeah and i was like yes i want that i if i can choose a life i want that one and uh i got it you know the navy came through uh it it did it did it's like one thing i knew about joining the navy is that you were going to probably live next to the beach you probably weren't going to get stationed in pocatello idaho working in supply in a supply room in the middle of nowhere you know, with a low dating pool and being single. No, <laughs> I wanted to be near the beach and uh, it, it delivered, but I, I did not know I was going to join the Navy. You know, I had yeah. the, I had the airborne guys trying to recruit me because, you know, they knew me on the base and I'd gotten some bar fights with them. They're like, yeah, you're pretty tough. You should join the airborne. <laughs> I'm like, cool. Maybe I'll, nah, I don't want to be around you guys. So for some reason I wanted to reject that. And then I got in some trouble in Italy. So I had to sign a waiver to join the Navy. But that was first after getting uh, rejected by the Air Force because I had had a wild youth. And um, the the Navy is like, come on in, boy. No problem. Sign right up. And I'm like, OK. I go, I want to be a Navy SEAL. And they're like, great. Sign up. And, you know, I needed to lose about 20, 30 pounds. But I did grow up competitively swimming and, and you know, running and all that stuff. But I was not working out at all. And this guy didn't tell me you need to put in 35 miles of road work. And you need to work on this, you know, now they have schools where you can go pay and get prepared and show up to buds and be ready. And then he didn't even tell me which rate to pick. I'm just telling you. So recruiter that recruited me up in Burlington, Vermont, this is what happened. Okay. He sent me to deck basically, but I had a good ass fat. So in, in, in boot camp, they pulled me aside and said, Hey, uh, you want to do something other than deck? I go, why isn't deck cool? Don't we get to play with the anchors and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and he offered me a, a reenlistment mm-hmm. bonus for signalman. So that's how I ended up meeting you. And I don't know. you. Well, the uh, signalman rate's pretty cool. Uh, I, I, I've always, you know, my division officer tour was as the communications officer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had signalman under me as a divo and then uh, as an opso. So I, I've always been close to signalman and I've always totally related to what you guys do. Uh, and if, if I had been enlisted, I might well have chosen Sigelman as well. It's, pre- it's pretty interesting. So what years were you in Italy? I was wondering if we're there at the same time. Let's see. I was, uh, I was, in, well, I was in Italy twice, okay? I had the, uh, I guess I haven't mentioned my tour. I had a tour in between the Mount Hood and the uh, carrier. Okay. I guess, you know, officers have a seashore, seashore rotation. Okay. And so my, I had C on the Stein, the frigate, Shore, uh, the Italian exchange duty, C, the Mount Hood department head, Shore, my post department head was back in Navy, back in, uh, in Italy, okay. this time in Naples. Okay. So, and this, so I had three and a half years in Naples. I, I had three years in, in Italy, in Northern Italy, and that was from 86 to 89. 86 to 89 is when I was hanging out in Livorno. I was there. I was mm-hmm. walking in your Where shadow. You? I was partying oh on gosh. the beach. I was down at the base in the summer. I'd work as a lifeguard in 86. I trained all the lifeguards for all the bases, including Livorno and the beach and the base lifeguards. Oh, man. That- <laughs> well, yeah, we were in the same. Okay. Now, do you remember just south of the city of Livorno were these cl- seaside cliffs mm-hmm. where you could Go down to the to the water, the volcanic cliffs. Do, 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 do you know the part of, I'm, talk, I'm talking? I'm talking. I remember about? them vaguely. Just, I spent a lot of my time in Terrania and then over by the tower. Yeah, 
and on the base mostly because I didn't I didn't have a car every time I went down there. I was a kid, and you know, expensive it was to have a car. Ah, okay. But uh, I did hang out. Oh, I had a car. I I got to ship my my uh, my Ford EXP two seater. Oh, cool. <laughs> over to Italy. It was jet black with red pinstripes. It looked like a mini Batmobile. <laughs> And uh, I I drove that all over Italy and had a great time. And you get that subsidized gasoline, right, on the post? Yeah, yeah, right. We had ration. We had like coupons. You'd buy the the, the fuel coupons, and uh, then you actually I think the the military you bought fuel coupons from the military, and then you 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 could use them at at Ajip. Yeah. Do you remember yeah, that? Ajip yeah. was that gas station that had that kind of devil uh-huh. dog. It was the yellow <laughs> exactly. logo with the black devil dog and the flame coming mm-hmm. out of its mouth. I was like, what is this devil fire breathing gasoline dog? Okay. <laughs> but you, you, did you ever hang out in the square near the Continental Hotel, Hotel Continentale, right downtown, uh, Livorno, the Terrania there? It's like, no, I, you, you go, me, yeah, I, okay, I didn't, I didn't hang out that much in the city of Livorno, okay. honestly. Um, my, remember, I was, I was an instructor at the Italian Naval Academy. That's what, is in Livorno. And that was my tour was an exchange instructor at the Italian Naval Academy. So you Academy. get a very Italian then. You were around the Paisan. Yeah, I was the, uh, dude, I, I would, the only time I would hear English all week would be on the, on the day I went up to Camp Darby. So I would, I would have, you know, six days of nothing but Italian. Uh, but b- because like my students, how should, now, you know, Lynn, that I don't have a problem with fraternizing. In fact, no. like I'm, <laughs> if I'm, I'm the, op, I'm an officer who, never goes to the officer's club, you know? Uh, yeah. And, but, but it's different with students. Like, I guess like, you know, the, the officers on a ship and the enlisted crew on the ship is a much tighter bond than like at a Naval Academy where you, you have to maintain the, authority in that position. Yeah. At first it, 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 I couldn't, I had no desire to, nor yeah. to, 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 to party with them because they were, I don't know. It, it, it just didn't. It, I, understand. I, I avoided. I avoided the places in the city where they were. So I would generally go to. The, I would go further. I would go to. I would go to Pisa. I would go to Lucca. I would go to Florence. Yeah. <laughs> or to Rome. Actually, I went to Rome almost every weekend, uh, and I spent a whole summer there. So Florence was Florence um, was amazing too. I love Florence. Remember, they had all those desserts in the window. Those strawberry parfait things. I forget what those were. I remember them in the windows. Florence had uh, interesting history. Uh, the monster. Did you ever hear about the monster? I know this is a sidetrack, but yes, yes, yes. It wasn't. He was like it would murder cu- like couples. Yeah, he was. He yeah, was like the that skelter. is so weird. I can't believe you know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was that the monster of 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 uh, ter- of, of that re- of that region. I remember that. Well, yeah, Hannibal uh, Lecter, wow. the second Hannibal Lecter movie is based on that guy, yeah. that the killer that was lurking wow. in the countryside that they couldn't catch. And they, they yeah. thought that it was a bunch of guys from Sardinia. And, um, it was interesting cause it was like, people would be making out in the countryside. And so there was a mm-hmm. group of, you know, peeping Toms, but then the monster would come out. They called him the Il Mostro. And he had, he had Florence terrorized. Yeah. And when I was down there yeah. the same year, you were down there. I remember that. I was yeah. uh I was partying downtown um was that Livorno and I I don't know I'd had too much to drink so I ran off into the woods that are by the beaches you know how there was a deep set of woods before you got to the sand right yeah. and I go out and there's this couple making out and I'm, I sneak up on them I'm like rah and they ran away I'm like no <laughs> way <laughs> yeah. that's mean well you know a couple 20 beers in you and okay. so I sat there took the bench over and I had my boom box as my pillow and I crashed out and I wake up and I hear like what I thought was choking or something like, ah, I go, oh, crap. So I'm like, I turn up my music real loud and I'm just pointing it in all directions. And I hop out of there. I realize my 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 shoes had been stolen while I was sleeping. And I'm walking on all those pine needles. And uh, then I hitchhike back to the base. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it was four in the morning. And I'm like, everyone had warned me, watch out for the monster. I'm like, ha ha, I'm being the monster. Now the monster's it, on me. Yeah. Right? Gosh, that is an amazing story. It's pretty silly, but yeah, that, that, that happened. So well, are you? Oh, hey, I thought of something. I thought of something. Cause I, I think we only have about 10 minutes left in That's this fine. thing, 10 or 15 minutes. So I wanted to say, I'm thinking like, you know, is there anything about the Mount Hood that I for sure want us to talk about if we can? Sure. And like one thing that, that, that came to my mind is like, were you on there when, when the women came aboard? Yes, I was. 
Okay. Was that not an amazing experience? It was, uh, it was very uh, cool. I have a lot of great, you know, female shipmates from there. It was an instant change though, because the, the ship was so alpha, roughy and aggro yeah. before they came on board. But, but I didn't notice it that big of a, how, how, okay, here's my, here was my viewpoint on it. And maybe you have a different one or you, but like at the beginning, when the women first came on, it was not a big deal. Right. You know, everyone thought it would be a big deal. Everyone, you know, was scared or whatever, but I didn't notice any downside to it. You know, maybe the, you say maybe the ship was a little less. Uh, it was nicer. It was actually uh, nicer when whatever, they came but, on board in a way, because. But like I, I, I have seen and heard, especially as my neighbor career went on further after the Mount Hood, that there was a lot of of other commands it had problems had issues had fraternization you know, problems it, or romances that didn't well by, by the by the time i was in x when i went to the pre-xo school uh you know uh five or six years after that the complaint of the of the co and xo students was that the the dominant theme of the training was sexual uh, you know, discrimination, prevention, awareness, like how to deal with sexual discrimination issues, how to prevent mm -hmm. sexual dis, uh, issues from happening in your command. And that like the, 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 that there was more time spent on that than there was on fighting right. and missiles and torpedoes and like, and, and they were right, you know? And so I was thinking, what did we do correct on the Mount Hood? Because we had no problems at all. No, <laughs> the women came on, they did a great job. Yeah. Uh, and so like, were we the exception or was it just cause it was at the beginning? I don't know. I wanted to talk I, I, I it think out. That, I think we were, maybe we were an exception because you could compare us to like the gompers that ended up with numerous pregnancies, alleged, uh, prostitution, yeah, yeah. alleged, alleged prostitution that. and other things. I don't, you know, I say allegedly, I just, you know, you hear sea stories mm -hmm. from other people, right? Um, not that there was a whole circuit, but like a couple people got accused of it. Um, pregnancies, um, things that normally wouldn't happen on a ship before that, right? That would take away from its functionality. But our ship, we had um, the the woman integrated very well, and we even had, as as you yeah. brought up the other day, I mean, Admiral Howard came from our ship, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah that's something we, we we definitely want to give her mention uh, on this podcast that uh, we had aboard as our chief engineer uh, during the Desert Storm cruise. Uh, then Lieutenant Michelle Howard, mm -hmm. uh, who has uh, risen to be the first. I'm, I'm, she might be the first female, not even the first black female, but she's a four star admiral, like number two or three admiral in the whole darn Navy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and she was she was department head on our ship. And uh, what's I she deserves it, you know. I never met a more conscientious, dedicated naval officer than Michelle Howard. You know, she was so Navy. It was insane. It, and it was not about her. I mean, yeah. it, she wasn't doing it for her own ego. She was like the Navy's Navy man, even though she was a woman. And, she, you know, I never met a person who deserved Admiral more than her. And I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that she made it to where she's been. And I, I would love to get in touch with her and talk to her again, but you know, admirals, they make it impossible to find out what their email or anything is. So I have no way to reach they her. Beca they but become I, like I a top to secret uh, destination that you can't talk to until they're unclassified one day. <laughs> I don't know, but th 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 it's true. Yeah. Th th I, I guess the fact that we had such a famous female officer uh, come from our ship during that, that integration, I guess then I answered our, I answered my own question. Like, we were kind of an exception. We were above average yeah. in our in, in how well we integrated the women. You know, it's interesting. There's a few people that got married off of there, and they, yes, and there they are. are still happily married today. I know. Yeah, I know two of two couples like that, and they were so discreet on the ship. Yeah. Right? Uh, you can't point to the to an incident like I can't. Like, oh, they were caught. No. You know, in the cloakroom or something. No, they were completely discreet, and it was only after one or both left the ship that their relationship became known. And that's how it should be, right? It's, uh, it's, it's a tough rule. It's a tough rule because you know you're there to work. I mean, you could work anywhere, like you're working in the computer industry and meet a girl at work, and 
even there, there's a slight tone of it in today's workforce, isn't there? Like, uh, well, you get to stay professional. We don't want to get sued. And, you know, just I, I went and worked in the health club business. And let me tell you, it was even more like super laid down, like there will be no sexual harassment, anything even implied. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, this is this is a more rough speech than I heard in the Navy. And um, mm-hmm. I, I kept it professional. I did not try to fraternize with anybody on the ship. I was married. I, I kept it, you know, mm-hmm. I kept it where it was supposed to be, but I understood other people. And you know what? Look at that, that their marriages far outlasted mine. You know, they're still together today. And I'm like, what is that bonded by war? I mean, what, what, what what's well, the know, secret? I don't, I don't remember on the Mount Hood. It, maybe you remember differently. I don't remember like a bunch of special rules that we had to follow because of the women, you know, like I, I was on commands after that where they, you know, like you, you were never allowed to be behind a closed door with the person of the opposite sex without another person there. Right. It was a, it was, the, it was a rule. And I don't remember like that. I don't remember on the Mount hood that we had rules like hard rules like that. We didn't have, it's almost like if you create the rules, they're going to get broken. And if you just treat people responsibly, yeah, they behave responsibly. Uh, and maybe that's kind of a life lesson that we got out of that. Uh, I had a, but, we had, we saw we were getting um, a female signalman. And that was uh, Morales. And we started coming on board and we all looked at each other. We're on the signal bridge. We're like, okay, guys, it's all professional, man. From here on out, no bullshit. And that's how we kept it. We kept it that way. We did not, nobody was Mm -hmm. like, hey, hey, hey. And, you know, it was like, hey, we're here to do work. And we kept it very military. And Mm -hmm. that, that kept a balance. We didn't have endless speeches. I mean, the guys that I was with, you know, not all, but Mm -hmm. a couple of them were like, you know, you know, they're lady crazy they're like yeah it's all mm-hmm. they talk about dirty sea stories you know <laughs> like, yeah what well, have you have you noticed now that you're a more mature man or, or human being have you noticed that like a way to get people to do stuff is to is to, to is to yell at them not to do it right <laughs> you know, the more <laughs> prohibited you make something the more likely it is that people are going to do yeah, it yeah, well, and, yeah, someone yeah, running around <laughs> whatever you do don't do this <laughs> coming into each department you know? each day <laughs> the plan of the day whatever you do don't do this we probably would have had 10 babies who knows i mean maybe but you know, and, and we and let's give credit to captain westman mm-hmm. right he was our co uh, when we brought the women on board and he was our co in, in desert storm yeah and he was a great CO. He really have was. Have you kept in touch with any of the officers? No, I have not. Uh, <clears throat> I have not. Um, it's, it's interesting that you say that because as an officer, you end up as like manager of companies, like little companies. Like I'm in charge of the maintenance company. It's like we're using a civilian comparison, right? I'm in charge of this school over here. I'm the manager of the school. And I listened to a podcast by this CB friend of mine that I just made friends with. He has a podcast, Josh O'Brien, and he did the whole CB tour. And he was talking to an officer and his officer felt disconnected from a lot of his crew and his people because he was in charge of the base. He was the base commander and he had to be strict all the time and he couldn't be everybody's buddy, you know? So, you know, that's what I, that's what I saw. Yeah. You know, so you, you now you're getting in touch with us because you were cool. I mean, we liked you as a person. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, the the yeah, the I think who was I believe his name was Wilcox. Was that the senior chief? I think so. Of our department that the ETCS Wilcox. I believe so. Did I get yeah. that right. Uh, and Kennedy Kennedy he, Kennedy was there too, right? Was it Chief Kennedy? Wasn't he like the radio man chief? Mm, I I. I don't remember that. Okay. One. Um, there was a chief knee chief, the radio man chief knee house. Okay. Do you, that is, that was, that I am in touch with now through the internet. But, uh, yeah, the officers, uh, not, not a single one. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I'm in touch with five or six of, of, of the crew, but none of the officers. It's interesting how that works, but it is like, it's how you connect and where you connect. And, you know, we're still going to hang out next time you come through here. And, you know, uh, Griffith wanted to, he's like, yeah, I'd be great friends with him. That would be like my buddy. Cause he had a lot in common with you. And I think you guys hung out once up in Oregon. He said he took you to some bars up there, some music and stuff like that. Showed you around a little bit. When we went to Portland. Oh, boy. Yes. I had a, you're pulling it out of your head. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're making me feel old, you know, when you have like memories that you have to like, you have to go and reactivate them. But yeah, you should look him up when you're up in Oregon sometime. He's, are you I ever will. go up there? No, I don't. Uh, I don't. But he needs to look you up when he catches you over here, okay. I guess. Well, hopefully we will all be uh, at the next Mount Hood reunion. Oh, we definitely will. And I really appreciate you coming on board and being the first and only officer I've had on here. My uh, World Tour 007 favorite ops boss. Um, Yeah, I mean, and I'll be honest with you. I didn't have, you know, I just enjoyed our friendship differently than I did from, you know, I'm not hating any other officers. I just was closer to you than the other ones I remember. Yeah, I'll admit I was not like most of the other officers. I got in trouble. I got in frater- more trouble for fraternization and not trouble. Like I never did anything wrong. I mean, there was never an incident, but it was just known that I hung out with sailors yeah. from time to time. And that was a no, no. And, uh, I, it's just always been that way. <laughs> it's always been that way. Uh, from my earliest cruise, uh, you know, I remember the, the back as a midshipman and we go on these, these month cruises, uh, in the summer. And I remember, just, you know, when I was in dungarees working in the deck department, how I felt at home. <laughs> and when I was in khakis sitting in the wardroom, I felt weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of them had a better, much better paycheck. And uh... so I was like, an, uh, although I did wear the officer's uniform, I, I, I've i been more of a, uh, I haven't been a, as much as a, of an officer at heart, I, I, I guess, as some some others. But th- that's why maybe that's maybe why I didn't get command of a combatant, you know, because the guys that get command of the combatants are that way. They are that way a hundred percent. Yeah, and that's you know, I, and I'm not them. And and God bless them. Uh, I had a different path, and and I thank God I I took it because I'm a, I'm a pretty happy man today when yeah, i know you're a great you're a great person you're fun to hang out with and any other shipmates if uh you haven't talked to john in a while be free to reach out to him because you've just heard the story from him and you know maybe i'll have you on again if more stuff like comes to mind i'm gonna try to go 20 30 40 shipmates deep and then come back mm-hmm. around probably because like okay well you you have a great story and it was very entertaining talking to you today i really appreciate it well, I knew it would be, and it was, Lynn. And uh, it, let me uh, just say thank you, shipmate, for what you've done and what you're continuing to do. You are stepping out there and doing new stuff. Uh, that's important, you know. Like you're you're doing now. Like I'm not 70 or 80 years old. I'm not like a World War II vet that's about to knock off, right? And, and you better <laughs> interview me while you can, right? Because right? right? uh, there there is an effort to document the experiences of those of the greatest generation before they're gone, right? Uh, and you're, you're kind of doing that with our generation a little earlier. Yeah. I'm jumping <laughs> on it because I realize that if I try to, and I love it. if yeah. I pull it out of you when you're 75, you're like, Oh, the Navy it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, my memory already plays with my head now. I don't know if I have some CTE or something, but I noticed that my brain, like I have, I used to have a hundred percent recall and lately it's like, I need to do the podcast to keep everything rolling. And, and also I'm noticing everyone I talk to, it is bringing them back around full circle. Cause we're doing this in a kind of cool way. We're talking about 25 to 30 years ago and you know, every conversation, otherwise you're working in computers. Hey, here's the new app. Here's the new data. Here's the new, right. Yeah. But, uh, I appreciate having uh, someone as high caliber as you. And, you know, this is a wonderful podcast. Anyone else you want to say hi to out there in, uh, you know, the USS Mount Hood world. No, Lynn. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, just the thanks to you and, uh, to any, uh, any of our crew that are listening. I can't wait till the next reunion when I'm going to give every one of you a hug and, and a handshake, uh, and, and let's raise one uh, to the good hood. Thank you so much, John. And, uh, it's been a wonderful podcast. Ooh.